I'd like to thank everyone for coming today to the Mixed Methods webinar series brought to you um, jointly by the Mixed Methods International Research Association as well as the University of Alberta's International Institute for Qualitative Methodology. My name is Yvette McQuad and I work for IIQM as a program and event coordinator and I'll be your facilitator today. Uh, today's session will be by Dr. Peggy Shannon Baker introducing Mixed Methods in Courses on Research Design. So I'll just give a few housekeeping tips or housekeeping items before we get started. And also a quick note before I continue on, uh, I am on Twitter. So if anyone wants to also um, tweet about the workshop, you can find me uh, or tag me at P Shannon Baker, all one word, um, which will show up here on the title slide. Uh, you can also send me an email later on if you have any questions or want to talk more about this. So let's go ahead and get started talking about how we can go about introducing mixed methods research on, in courses on research design. What I had in mind when I proposed this webinar topic was the following objectives. So hopefully I can address each of these objectives here. Briefly, what I'm going to do first is introduce the scholarship of teaching and learning of mixed methods research. And then I also want to contextualize my discussion of designing and implementing these research methods courses in my own experience and context. Because as you'll see throughout the webinar, some of the things that I recommend for activities um, some of the ways that I frame the course are very much steeped in my own um, teaching experience and training experience in mixed methods. So some might apply really well, and be able to be transferred to your all's um, locations very well, and some might have to be kind of tweaked. So just keep, in, keep that in mind as we go on. And then I want to describe some activities and, and assessments that I've found are particularly helpful when we're thinking about how we teach and learn about mixed methods research. So why propose this particular topic? Most of the other IIQM webinars, if you um, have ever checked them out, um, if you haven't, feel free to go back to the IIQM uh, webpage to find the archive of these webinars you'll notice that most of the topics tend to be related to designing, conducting, or writing about mixed methods studies. So why propose this topic in particular? I was really interested in this topic of how we teach um, mixed methods research because it's part of this growing trend of publications in the scholarship of teaching and learning about mixed methods research. So right now I'm in the midst of a large literature review of the publications on this topic. And what I'm finding is that um, a lot of these articles uh, are starting to come up in the past decade or so, which is not surprising because the term mixed methods really was coined in the early 2000s. Um, but after that, as we're seeing older generations of people who either um, learned about mixed methods through their own self-education or this kind of new generation of folks, myself and some folks on the webinar here are included, who took courses on mixed methods, we're all starting to think now about what are the best ways to promote the learning about mixed methods uh, in different capacities in different types of classrooms. What's interesting, though, about this literature is that it's starting to also conceptualize uh, what I call a methodological literacy for thinking about mixed methods, which I've grouped into three different areas here. So when we're thinking about the teaching of mixed methods, we can think about it generally in terms of methodological literacy, where there the primary um, purpose is identifying and describing what's happening in the field, what's happening in a particular methodological design. Then taking that a step further, we can engage in methodological reasoning, which is where we can explain 
different design decisions that we engage with, particularly in how and why we're engaging with those particular decisions. And then the most important one that I've seen a lot referenced a lot in the literature is this methodological thinking, which is where you're actually applying what you know about mixed methods in order to design or implement a particular uh, mixed methods research study. What's unique or really telling about this research, though, on how we teach and learn mixed methods research is that it tends to be focused on courses that are solely devoted to mixed methods research. So it's not a general course. It's a course specific to mixed methods, like how we tend to have courses about qualitative research or quantitative research. And for the empirical studies that have looked at student feedback on these solo courses, what we see is that students often argue for the need to introduce mixed methods research earlier in their graduate careers. So with this in mind, I wanted to think about, OK, how do, what does this look like in research methods courses? If we look at general research methods courses within social and behavioral sciences, they tend to really focus on design rather than necessarily implementing a research study, which tends to happen later on in either more advanced courses or courses specific to a thesis or dissertation writing. Hopefully, these general research courses talk about research ethics, the research process. Um, they might distinguish between qualitative and quantitative forms of research although this usually depends on the training and background of the instructor themselves. And then hopefully they're engaging in some kind of practice in terms of research design. So coming up with a research problem, identifying strategies um, that might help us to address that problem, either through questions or hypotheses, and then identifying potential data collection and analysis procedures. What we also notice about these general research courses is that they tend to happen at the graduate and postgraduate level, depending on if you're in the US or the UK, although we do see some of these courses in advanced undergraduate um, programs. We also see that this general research methods course is a prereq for other advanced courses later on, such as a course specific to um, specific to mixed methods or some other form. We also see the people who are in the course as students tend to be current or future practitioners. So in my context, for example, a lot of the folks that I teach are people who are already teaching in primary and secondary schools. They might be counselors. You might also see organizational leaders or people who want to become researchers and so on. When we look at adding mixed methods to this general research course, these are some of the reasons why people have advocated for this. So one of the biggest ones is that there's increasing recognition um, in many of the social sciences and behavioral sciences that we should be doing or engaging in mixed methods research. I think that's what um, brings a lot of people to the IIQM webinars. And as I mentioned before, students really identify the need for this kind of introduction earlier on. So adding it to this general research methods course is really important. These two lower points here are points that I've found in my own teaching of these classes, which is that teaching or adding mixed methods to the general research methods course aligns really well with many of their pre-existing understandings of the quality of research. This is especially the case for educational research where teachers um, generally believe in the importance of multiple forms of assessment in a classroom. But this also um, is starting to align better with, with students' training that's becoming less focused on either qualitative focus or quantitative focus coursework or skills. And also adding this mixed methods 
research strand or topic within the general research methods courses can help to advocate for more specific mixed methods courses later. Because if students become really interested in the modules or weeks in which you talk about mixed methods, you can hopefully bring that back to your department later on to try to advocate for more mixed methods courses. So the purpose of this webinar is to bring together these two areas of scholarship. So there's the research on the teaching and learning of mixed methods research in these solo courses devoted explicitly to that methodology. And then also to what we know about the teaching and learning processes for research methods courses in general. And then I want to bring these together in order to make the case for introducing mixed methods research effectively in these preliminary courses. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, these are really steeped, or what I'm talking about here is really steeped in my own context and experience. I've taken solo courses on mixed methods research and also research methods courses, although they didn't talk about mixed methods research. And then I've also taught individual mixed methods research courses, as well as general educational research courses. And I've done that in two different environments, uh, in face-to-face -face environment, and then also in a completely online environment. When I think about designing a course, uh, I like to use two different frames. So the frame here, the second one, integrated course design, is a frame that other folks who have talked about the teaching and learning of mixed methods research use. I also use this other frame called understanding by design because of my training in education and teaching and learning. So understanding by design really briefly is where you first focus on identifying the goals of what you want the students to understand or be able to do. And then once you have those goals, then you identify what is appropriate evidence for those goals. And then once you've identified the types of evidence, so like an exam grade or a type of project or a type of paper, then you can identify learning activities that help build the student's knowledge and skills toward that evidence and toward those goals overall. I like to bring in the integrated course design framework to this as well, because you can see here, I've listed that this framing of how to design courses really takes into consideration the context for the class, which I'll talk about a little bit more next. Um, it also identifies that it's very important to assess students learning through various processes and that it's important to also include mechanisms for students to give you feedback as the instructor. So when I personally sit down to, to come up with a course plan, I think through all of these different types of um, contextual factors. So what are the learning goals that I've set up? What is the current climate in terms of um, acceptance of mixed methods research or acceptance of the topic that we're teaching about what is students prior existing knowledge or skills related to this how does mine fit in what are the institutional expectations so is does your institution or program for example really um, prefer either qualitative or quantitative or both and so they're not really or maybe they're not really as knowledgeable about mixed methods all of these contextual factors should be taken into account when you're thinking about introducing uh, mixed methods research in these courses. So I want to talk specifically about an introductory research methods course that I currently teach at Georgia Southern University. It's a fully online 16 week semester course that's primarily for master's level students in education, counseling, psychology, and engineering management. It's also a prerequisite course for educational specialists and educational doctorate students, but, but for the most part, the students in this course tend to be master's level students. So I'm gonna take a pause here because what I've listed here 
is how some of the course objectives line up with some of the module level objectives related to mixed methods research. So going back to that framework of understanding by design, I first come up with these course level objectives in the furthest left hand column, and then I identify or break that out in terms of mixed methods research or other types of methodology in the class. And then I identify the types of evidence that the students could give that might demonstrate those module level objectives. So let's take a moment to look at this table. What's really important for both of the frameworks for designing courses is that there's alignment across the course level objectives to what I call module level or weekly level objectives, or these kind of core grouping of topics to the activities and assessments. It would be unhelpful if you had activities or assessments that don't directly relate back to each of these different types of, object of objectives. So in this case, my course objectives are largely set by my department and the program that I teach in. There's some flexibility there, and you can see that not all of the course objectives are listed, but the module level objectives, things that I do each week or within each two week component of the class, I can vary depending on the things that I wanna teach about. So these are some of the objectives that I've written for concepts, terms, or designs that I want students to know about mixed methods research. So you can see, for example, I've identified here in this second module objective that it's very important that students understand the difference between mixed methods and multi-methods research. And then I might assess them on this topic through questions in the video lecture and then through exam questions. Now we get into the question of when should we introduce mixed methods research? So as I talked about earlier, it's really important to consider what types of experiences or backgrounds students have in relation to mixed methods research and other forms of research, or even the idea of research in general, before they come into the classroom, because that will impact what you do and how you can do what you do in the class. So in my context, uh, every semester I do an introductory survey where I ask the students, you know, how do you define research? Is it applicable to your career? Things like that. Uh, what kinds of courses have you taken that relate to research so that I get a general sense? Um, what I tend to find is that students have the most experience in quantitative courses or quantitatively oriented definitions of rigorous research, for example. So I start with qualitative research, um, which is kind of flipping the model on its end, because I want to try to demonstrate to them the rigor and the quality of qualitative research. Then I follow that up with a type of research that's very well aligned with qualitative thinking, and that's arts-based research. Then there's usually a midterm, because before this, I should have mentioned, we've already talked about research ethics how to identify a research problem, why people engage with research, um, and, and that kind of thing. So usually between arts-based and quantitative research, there's the midterm, and then we engage with uh, quantitative research. And then after that, we engage with action research, which I find is very helpful in starting to get people thinking about multi-methods research, because action research might use arts-based and qualitative and or quantitative in the same study. And then we can transition really nicely into mixed methods research, where for me, the important difference here is how you're mixing or integrating the two types of or multiple types of research that you're engaging in. So let's take some time to talk about specific topics and resources that I use when I teach mixed methods research in these introductory research methods courses. 
there are so many different topics that you could possibly cover in these classes. There's mental models and research paradigms, how those impact the research or how you can use them. There's different typologies for the types of research designs. Even how we're defining research methods can get really complicated. There's how to evaluate the rigor and quality of mixed methods research. There's really so many different topics that you could possibly include um, or to teach about in relation to mixed methods research. Even the studies that talk about solo mixed methods research courses talk about how difficult it is to cover all of this in one course, which is why many of them advocate for a two-part sequence. So how is it possible to, in such a limited time as like a general research methods course, introduce all of these things? Well, the trick is that you can't really introduce everything. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about are the things that I stress in the class, as well as things that I leave for the future or for students' own self-directed learning. So I tend to stress things that, again, go back to those contextual factors. Who are the students? What do they need to know in this class for future classes or for their future or current careers? And I also, as you might infer from a couple of slides ago, I really stress the identifying the similarities and differences between mixed methods research and other types of methodologies like action research. So here are some of those uh, module level objectives, again, as an example. The current text that I'm using in the educational research course is this text here by Locke, Miller, and Lester. In my course, I can choose my own textbook, which is really nice. Um, and there's so many different textbooks out there about research design or educational research, though not all of them have mixed methods research in them. So because of my training in mixed methods research, I took the time to look through all of the different types of texts that are available. And I considered whether or not they had mixed methods or if they didn't. Um, did they prepare students for thinking in this way and so on? So this particular text I chose because it matched with the education focused background, um, but it's also presents research in a way that talks about practitioner based research. That is research that professionals do um, as part of their career in order to improve their practice. So even though it's framed as educational research, it applies to non-education fields like um, psychology or counseling. So I like it in that way, but what I found is that the way that they talk about mixed methods research doesn't really line up with the rest of the research in the field. And so that, that was where I was able to use some of my knowledge about the mixed methods research field. So what I do is instead of having the students read this chapter, I supplement it with mixed methods um, texts, either from separate textbooks um, and or recently published empirical studies. The empirical studies, I really can't stress enough. Whenever I'm teaching about any of the research methodologies, it's super important to have both the theoretical discussion of the methods and then actually walk through empirical studies. And then I also have another feature in this course so it's an online course, so I can't host people face to face, but I have been able to host guest speakers like Tony Omogbuzi, Elizabeth Creamer, Mandy Archibald, and others to give a guest video lecture. So how this works is I identify a recently published mixed methods study, and um, I typically try to choose uh, an empirical study that relates to the topics of interest to the students that they would have told me in the intro survey. Then once I identify those, I reach out to the first author or the solo author to see if they're willing to make a 10 to 15 minute video about the methods of their study. In most cases, they're, they're willing, which is really great. But what I particularly like about this kind of resource is that especially for an online class where it's really text heavy, 
it allows you to have a kind of engagement with these scholars in the field. So it could be a quantitative um, study, it could be an action research study, but especially for mixed methods, what they get to see is the mixed methods in action. So the guest speaker can talk about the different um, challenges or important decisions that they had to make that maybe not didn't come up in the article, but it really gives them a sense of how the research methods are alive, that they're actually something that we critically engage with. So ultimately, it's about making the, these research methods more accessible to the As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's really difficult to try to address all of the different possible topics that you could teach about for mixed methods research. For me, there are two um, distinct areas of mixed methods research that I don't generally cover in these introductory to research methods courses, um, and I'll talk about why. So, the first one is all of the different typologies, definitions, the terms that we use in mixed methods, the reasons we use mixed methods, the designs that we use in, these, in this field. I generally don't, um, well, the designs we talk a little bit about and the rationales we talk a little bit about, but we don't talk about the different typologies. This is something that I think works much better in um, especially a two-part sequence to a course specifically on mixed methods research. And I also don't spend a lot of time mapping the field of mixed methods research for these intro students. The biggest reason why I don't do these things is that I think about who's in the classroom. So many of the students um, don't particularly like research and they many of them don't particularly see themselves as researchers, leave aside methodologists. Something like mapping the field of mixed methods is really great for training future researchers or for training future methodologists. And something like teaching all of the different definitions for mixed methods research, even in the solo course, can be difficult to keep track of who said what and which definition would you align with and why. Um, it gets very heated and it gets very kind of convoluted as these citations talk about. What I do do, however, is give the students resources for their own learning. In the online class, the way that I do this is through a page I, each week called Extend Your Learning. In this Extend Your Learning page, I give them resources related to the week's particular topic so that they can on their own further. So for example, I've given um, uh, an infographic that was put out by SAGE comparing qualitative research to quantitative research and mixed methods research. So that students could see this table of all of the descriptive differences between the, the methodology so they can understand how and why they differ and also how and why they're similar. I've also given um, additional videos, links to videos on YouTube, um, given more in-depth readings or more theoretical readings. And this is really the chance when the students can decide if a topic was unclear, they can go through it, or if they have a definitive interest in a particular topic or approach, they can really look at it there. And this is something that even in face-to-face -face classes, you can adopt a kind of resource page if you have Blackboard, Moodle, Canvas, one of those. You can set up a resources page where students can go back and look at these. And I reiterate throughout the whole semester, you know, even if you're not, you don't have the time to read them now, I encourage the students to still grab the materials so that they have them later for, um, and should they want them later on. Okay, let's now talk about the different activities and assessments that I do in these intro to research methods courses. So what you're looking at here is in the EDUR 7130 course on educational research or the introduction to research methods. 
you're looking at the distribution of grades for the students. So you can see here that I use multiple forms of assessment, which I think very much aligns with mixed methods research. What do I mean by multiple forms of assessment? Well, if you look in the lower right hand corner here, about a third of their grade is in exams, which are generally multiple choice um, timed exams that are available online. Then uh, a portion of their grade is on weekly activities that I call module activities. Module activity is just kind of like an umbrella term that I use for anything that could be a discussion board post, a Twitter thread, a writing journal, creating some kind of visual and posting it to the course page, anything. Um, it's kind of like a catch all for some kind of interactive writing or creating piece for the week. And then you'll see that half of their grade is related to this thing called the mock research project, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it's basically where students are engaging in applying their design-based practice. They don't actually conduct a study, but they practice designing a study of their in, on a topic of their interest in different uh, methodologies. So this, uh, again, this, um, the syllabus for this course and the, a copy of the um, PowerPoint slides, the course schedule, um, and information on this particular assignment, the mock research project is available in the tinyurl.com slash teaching MMR link. So every week, the students have an interactive video lecture. So again, this is a fully online class, but some of these components you can still integrate into a face-to-face -face or even a blended class, blended class where part of it is online or part of it is face-to-face. -face. One of the most important pieces to learning about research methods, and this cuts across the literature both on teaching and learning research methods and teaching and learning mixed methods, is that methodological literacy, which is modeling how to read these mixed methods studies. So the, it's an empirical study, a study where the researchers engaged with people in some capacity, collected, analyzed data, and published it. So in these interactive video lectures, each week when we're talking about a different methodology or a different empirical study, I model how I go about reading it by explaining how I read it and why I read the study in, in a particular way. So this engages with the methodological reasoning. And then I also explain what we can see and what we can't see based on what they published. So for instance, if they don't really talk about how they engaged in reflexivity, if they don't really talk about um, their missing data or things like that, we can engage in those kinds of things. So I model the types of questions that they can ask, the students should ask as they're reading themselves. I also model identifying particular components of a design, but based on my own mock topic. So as I mentioned, they're doing, they identify a topic of interest to them as part of their mock research project. So I, along with them, have a mock topic, which differs between semesters. So as we get to a different methodology, like arts-based research or mixed methods research, I demonstrate that methodological reasoning by applying the methodology and design to the particular topic I've picked. And I explain the different design choices that I've made um, as we go through the different weeks on each of the topics. I also ask um, questions or leave blank lecture slides in the handouts to encourage students to engage in a kind of self-assessment as they're going around, going through the lecture video. As with face-to-face -face classes, there's also opportunities for small group discussions. But for this, I really want to specify how these small groups discussions are particularly beneficial to learning about mixed methods research. 
So in the first box here, you can see um, they've identified this topic, this research topic that they might want to look into. So they want to see um, whether or not a new program or a new um, counseling approach is going to help their clients. So what I do here is I, dis I break the students up into groups according to um, their topic as opposed to according to their design. And I do this in, for an important reason. In my teaching of a solo mixed methods course where there's a lot more time to delve into the nuances of a particular design like concurrent mixed methods design or sequential explanatory, you can break students up into um, design type so that within the group, even though there's many different topics, they can really look into um, you know, the importance of different sampling strategies in the designs. You, can't, you don't really have the time for identifying that level of nuance in the introductory to research methods course. So instead, I break them up by topic. So for instance, um, one topic group could be um, services and programs for marginalized communities. And then within that, all of the students would have picked different types of designs. So instead, what they're seeing is the wealth and diversity of types of designs that they can use in addressing that particular topic. I also have them uh, select, in selecting a, a design for their topic, what's particularly important um, for allowing them to do or design a fake study based on their own interests, this component, I think, really aligns with the pragma pragmatic approach to mixed methods research or wanting the students to engage in research that they can actually turn around and then use. Um, and then I also try to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer discussion. So this is something we should be doing in all of our classes, right? Irregardless of if it's research methods, if it's multicultural ed, it, you should be helping them to talk with one another and pose questions, right? But what's especially important here is that we can learn about some of the methodological and ethical issues to conducting mixed methods research. And this is also the time when either through that video lecture or through the example questions that you pose to this, the whole class as ways to prompt their thinking peer to peer is that you're actually modeling how to think like a researcher. So what are the kinds of questions that a mixed methods researcher would ask when they're reading or designing a study? So posing these questions as a model and then asking them to ask questions of each other can actually help facilitate a richer, more dynamic um, peer to peer discussion. And that applies to both face-to-face -face and to the online environment as well. Let's go back now to the mock research project. So this is the mock research project is an umbrella concept for all of these different types of assignments that are listed here in the left-hand column. So the students will select a topic that they're interested in, and then they design or they write a research problem, an ethics statement, a qualitative design, a quantitative design, a design of their choice, and then a final reflection on everything they've learned about research, which was their best design, and so on at the end of the semester. So the reason why I have these three different design statements is that in my institution, there's a lot of emphasis on qualitative designing research and quantitative design research. There's also a core group of folks that do these other forms of research where ABR is short for arts-based research, AR is action research or mixed methods research. I can't possibly assign a design statement for all of them and I need to make sure that they understand the, the nuances to qualitative and quantitative so I have to have those. So what I opted for is allowing them to choose to design a study across these different methodologies. So 
and they've also identified their research problem and so on. And these relate back to various course level objectives. The biggest one being what's, I apologize in small font here, the pra practicing basic research design skills like um, identifying uh, important data collection instruments, identifying an appropriate sampling technique and so on. So to talk specifically about the mixed methods research design statement, um, I can share anecdotally that about 80 to 90% of the students tend to select the mixed methods research design across the three different options. It could be based on time because the mixed methods research tends to be at the end of the semester. And if you've forgotten you needed to choose one, oh my gosh, it's the end of the semester, you need to choose one. So sure, I'll do mixed methods. It could be time-based, it could be general interest-based. There's a research study in there somewhere for me to do at a future time. Um, but there is a, a lot of students, I think, that are also interested in the mixed methods research design. There's an important study by Thomas Christ that actually analyzed uh, or compared students who took a general research methods class to students who took a mixed methods solo class. And he actually found that students tended to pick designs that were either action research, qualitative, or mixed methods over quantitative research methodologies. And he attributed this to the trends in the field of educational research in particular. But I think it applies to what I'm seeing also when I teach this course. So you'll notice if you're really carefully reading the, the right-hand column here, which is the, a screenshot of the rubric, you notice that it's otherwise what I call a check-wise rubric. Is the thing there or is it not there? And some people, especially folks who teach mixed methods courses on their own, people who teach advanced research methods courses might look at this and say, wow, you know, there's, there's so much that's left to interpretation. You know, what if their mixed methods research question isn't a good question? Um, you can see that according to the rubric, if they have it, they get one point. If they don't have it, they get zero for this category. Because the reason why I've done this is I've set a relatively low bar. And this is, again, going back to the context of the students who are in the course. This is like a first draft of a pilot study design. So it's very early. There's minimal details. A copy of this full rubric is on. Uh, the web page that I've linked there. You can see I'm very strict about the word count. So they can really get a taste for designing mixed methods research. Because then what I focus on in my feedback is should they decide to do this study in the future? Here's some feedback. And this is where I can bring in, hey, you know, your plans for how you bring together your qualitative and your quantitative data don't really match up. Or, hey, your mixed methods research question could be stronger if you wrote it like this or if you focused on this. So you can see that my feedback tends to focus on three things. Like I have three mini paragraphs usually. One is on the strengths. One is on what they should think about if they implement this study. Like if they actually turn around, graduate, and decide to do the study. And then the third is on writing, um, which is really important for the methodological thinking. How can we describe what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it, especially for a mixed methods study. You'll also notice in the rubric that I have this section here, which is a bonus. Uh, the bonus is where students can create a research diagram. So it's a visual, also known as a joint display, about their study that helps to communicate the relationship between the different approaches that they're using. So what I've found so far is that these research diagrams are really helpful in getting me to see if they actually understand the integration component to mixed methods research. So in particular on that point, what I'm hoping to do in future classes, like how I'm, I'm improving or continuing to shake up how I'm teaching mixed methods research in these courses. If you look at the bottom one here in multimodal, I'm gonna actually require the research diagram because the research diagram 
Um, visually is really helpful for me, especially once students put in specific information, like they're going to collect um, these number of surveys or conduct these number of interviews. It's really helpful for me to see that they understand the timing and the mixing of these, which is crucial to mixed methods. Um, to go going back up to the top, what I have now, everyone has to go through these three optional methodologies. But what instead is it's going to look like is after we cover qualitative and quantitative, it'll be the kind of choose your own journey where the students will choose which method methodology they want to engage with, and then they'll have that methodology for three weeks. Otherwise, the students right now have each of these methodologies for one week only. And what this will mean, kind of in, um, pulling some inferences from some earlier points that I made, is that I'll be able to give a more in-depth discussion of their designs, as well as um, demonstrate some strategies for how to integrate qualitative and quantitative in art space and all these different types of approaches into their research, um, mixed methods research designs. So to summarize, uh, well, before I summarize, let me point out one important thing that's in the mixed methods uh, research on teaching about mixed methods. And there's there are two um, references here that indicate we should really advocate for replacing qualitative and quantitative designators with courses that are um, essentially mixed methods inclined or presenting all of these methodologies on a continuum. Because of some of the programmatic and institutional context here, as well as my own lack of experience and training in presenting research on like a continuum or without using qualitative and quantitative, I don't currently teach in this way, though I can see the benefit. So if you're interested in maybe um, abandoning those designators, you might check out those references. I suspect that it would require a cohort of people at your institution and elsewhere to buy in, because if I presented research um, on a continuum in this course, it might not line up well with other courses that the students have to take. So it would really take a group of people to engage with this. So ultimately, the more mixed methods research courses that we're teaching, we'll be able to understand more of the nuances to teaching and learning about mixed methods research. And as I stress throughout the presentation, there is so much um, important information you can pull from the context, whether it's the students, your institution, the learning goals that you set up, et cetera. And then from there, you can really craft appropriate and effective activities and assessment toward those goals and toward those students in particular. And that's where you have to identify what you're going to cut and what you're going to keep in the class. And I also really want to stress the importance of multimodal learning and multimodal assessment. You can see I have different types of assessment here, but Philosophically, I think this really aligns well with mixed methods research, but it's surprisingly not been a topic covered in the literature on teaching mixed methods research. So that could be an important area um, for people to investigate in the future. So here are the references. And here's again my Twitter handle, email, and the URL with the presentation materials, the course syllabus the course schedule, and the, the mixed methods design rubric. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Great. Thank you very much, Peggy, for that great presentation. If anyone has questions, uh, you can raise your hand or you can write it down below. If you raise your hand, we can give you the microphone. You can tell us your name and where you're from. Otherwise, you can write your questions in the chat below. number of people writing, so that's always good. Full of helpful suggestions, two takeaways, know your audience and know when to stop. <laughs> I completely agree. Thank you so much for sharing that. The knowing when to stop has been especially important because of the mixed methods training that I have. And you know, I'm obviously very enthusiastic about mixed methods research. I could talk about it forever. 
Um, I want to teach individual mixed methods research courses here at Georgia Southern. We don't yet have them. Um, but yeah, we have to know when to stop and to leave some of that for that student directed learning. And another person says, thanks so much. Clear presentation and well structured. Thank you for that. I particularly like the possibility of small group discussions. I never considered that. It seems very helpful. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for sharing that comment. The small discussions, um, I think, you know, if you're in education, you kind, that's kind of, you know, accepted, like we should have small group discussions and large group discussions. But what is really important for me, um, both as somebody who teaches mixed methods research and just as a consumer of the literature, I was really surprised that not a lot of mixed methods researchers talk about how some of these nuances to teaching, the activities that we do, the assessments, can really particularly apply to the teaching and learning of mixed methods research. So the focus on small group um, discussions, you know, talking about whether to group by topic or group by design, um, it's really important because, as I mentioned, you know, you could teach particular things, particular nuances about mixed methods research depending on how you group people. And I'm a big proponent of intentional grouping. You know, if you can spend conscious energy, like if you do a peer-to-peer -peer feedback, um, it might be really good to pair somebody who's really strong in the content with somebody who's really strong in the methods. Just like how you would do if you're engaging with a mixed methods team-based research. You want to have somebody who's good in content, somebody who's good in methods, maybe somebody who's good at writing, because not everybody likes to write about research. So you engage with people's strengths. You can do the same thing in the classroom by intentionally pairing people up so that they hopefully help to um, talk to one another across those topics. Any other questions or, or comments? Anyone want to share their experiences having taken, has anyone taken a course, a general research methods course that taught mixed methods? I'm also curious to know about that. Yeah, Rachel says she taught a class like this one. It's a great way to introduce mixed methods research for new researchers. I agree. Let's get them early. <laughs> but really, you know, even the students, when they take those solo mixed methods research courses and they didn't get an introduction earlier, everyone, I know I felt it, people in, in the literature are saying it, students in the literature are saying it, they really wish they had this earlier on. So they clearly identified that they want it. I see lots of folks are typing. That's great. As people are typing, I'll just um, reiterate, if people are teaching a course, they want to ask a question, you can feel free to email me or, or send me a Twitter direct message, or you can tweet me. Um, I'm happy to talk more about teaching mixed methods, um, about learning mixed methods. I am uh, translating this webinar into part of uh, the MOOC course, which is an online uh, certificate in mixed methods research that the Mixed Methods International Research Association is putting together, um, as well as a publication specific to teaching mixed methods research in an intro to research design course. So be on the lookout for a link to the, the MOOC um, and possibly a publication in the next year or so. So we have another one. A point is that many of my colleagues seem to understand mixed methods as a bit of qual and a bit of quant, but not as a research approach on its own right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's where I like to really stress um, that it's the mixing that really differentiates mixed methods from something else. Because you have to find a way to get, if you have a qualitative and quantitative approaches in the same study, you have to find a way to get them to speak to one another, right? So you might transform 
the qualitative data into numbers to help uh, cross analyze it with quantitative research, that's not really something that qualitative researchers do on their own in a pure sense. Um, so talking about the integration point, how the integration analyses are really important um, as a way to distinguish MISC methods could be really helpful there at your institution, friends. Another person said, thank you very much for your helpful presentation. Do you have a special idea to teach mixed methods in the form of a workshop? So I know there's there are many other webinars that IIQM has listed, including in their archive. Um, I don't know, Reza, where you are, but there's also the Mixed Methods International Research Association is having a conference in Vienna, Austria in August. If you're able to go, there'll be workshops there. Um, there's many, also many videos online. Um, you can send me an email and I can send you some uh, links to other mixed methods videos that are free online if you want to have access to those as well. Yeah, and Rachel mentioned that the University of Michigan also offers many mixed methods workshops. And Mary Kay is asking, can we get a copy of the presentation for a reminder of what we learned? Absolutely. Mary Kay, if you can see the screen, um, there's a tiny URL link, which I'll dictate to you, tinyurl.com forward slash teaching MMR. That's teaching as a gerund with the ING MMR. You'll be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides as a PDF, the course schedule and syllabus, and then the rubric that I showed earlier. And Yvette also posted that a copy of the presentation will be available on IIQM's website, as well as a video of this presentation. If there was something that I said that maybe wasn't exactly on the slide, you can capture it. It should be um, up in about a week's time, Yvette, is that right? Um, yeah, depending, it might be a week or two. Or we've got a workshop series here in Edmonton, uh, in the, so we're pretty busy with that. So. Might be a, it might be two minutes, but it should be within a week or two. Okay. Or, Mary Kay, if you're on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter, and as soon as the video is up, I'll be sure to, to tweet it out to people as well. Perfect. Okay, we are at time. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming to this presentation, brought to you in part by Mira as well as IIQM. Um, I believe we're taking a hiatus for the summer. Um, for July and August, but September we'll be back um, with Vanessa Sherman and she'll be speaking on instrument development in the context of method framework. Um, so you can look out for that registration for that will be up in the summer. Um, hey, do you have any final words? No, I'll just reiterate, feel free to contact me via Twitter, via email if you have any questions, comments, if you want any of the materials. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, who shared feedback and interacted. And please feel free to share this information as well with your colleagues. Perfect. Thank you all for coming, and have a great summer, and we'll see you in September. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Peggy.